Today we have Dr. Sajiraj to, you know, give us a lecture. Dr. Sajiraj, can you introduce yourself? Happy to do that. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to present and talk to this group. Uh, it's fascinating with the new technology we are able to connect globally. I know I see people coming from all over the world to join the platform. My name is uh, Ebenezer Satyaraj. And I'm an immunologist by training. I've been with Nestle uh, 18 years, and currently I lead a group called the Molecular Nutrition Group. And what my team does is tries to understand how nutrition impacts health or disease at the molecular level. So we look at things like microbiome, immune, the various omics platforms, with the goal to be able to really help use that information and knowledge to develop dietary products that will make a significant difference in the pet's life as well as in the people who love those pets. I started my career, I did my PhD back in India, and I know some of you on the platform are from there, back from the National Institute of Immunology in New Delhi. I came to the University of Chicago to do a postdoctoral fellowship. And then I was in the faculty at Northwestern University um, doing research in the area of autoimmunity. From then I went into industry, worked for a company in the East Coast, and I came to Nestle 18 years ago with a goal of trying to establish a nutritional immunology program. Much of the work that we're going to talk about today really happened when I was setting those research program here. Um, so looking forward to uh, having you listen to the lecture, and if there's questions, I'll be happy to have a discussion after that. Well, thank you for introducing yourself. Um, like Dr. You know, Yadra, Yadra, Sadira said, today we're going to have a lecture, like a very interesting lecture about, you know, a transformational approach to managing FLD1, which is the major cat allergy. Uh, he will explain to us how this allergy works and then how allergic people uh, get to live with it now by using Prina's new technology. So if everyone's ready, we can get started. Hello. One summer evening, almost a decade ago, our daughter returned from a play date with her friend. And very quickly, my wife and I noticed that she had swelling in the eyes, watery eyes, redness, as well as some rashes. After a few frantic phone calls, both to her friend's mom as well as the pediatrician, we quickly realized that she had spent the better part of the afternoon playing with a new cat that her friend had adopted and that she is allergic to cat. This instance started us on a journey, decade-long journey, that led to a scientific breakthrough for managing cat allergens that I'll be talking about today. My name is Dr. Ebenezer Sathiraj. I'm an immunologist, and I'm currently Director of Molecular Nutrition at Nestle Purina Research in St. Louis, Missouri. I lead, a, I lead a team of brilliant scientists who focus on trying to understand the relationship between nutrition and health at the molecular level. I started my career in academia, finishing a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois, then moved on to Northwestern University to be on their faculty before moving into industry, the pharmaceutical industry, where I conducted research in the area of inflammation and disease. I came to Nestle Pedina Research in 2003 with the goal of setting up a nutritional immunology program. And part of the work that I'm going to be talking about really came from the work that was initiated during that period. In my talk today, I will be starting by answering a fundamental question, which is what causes human allergies to cats? And I'll move on and give you a quick overview of this novel nutritional approach that we'll be talking about. Then I'll finish up by walking you through several scientific studies that shows both the safety and the efficacy of the approach. 
So let's begin by looking at the problem. Cat allergy is a major problem. It's one of the most common animal origin allergies in humans. The numbers based on countries vary quite a bit, but worldwide, on average, one in five adult, which is about 20% of the adult population in the world, have some level of sensitivities to cats. And as you look at the data, the level seems to be increasing over time. Cat allergies has significant consequences both for humans and cats. For cats, it limits the interaction between the allergic person and the cat because people who have allergies tend to avoid interacting with the cat. But this can be extremely challenging for the cat as well, has consequences for the cat because although we think cats tend to kind of live by themselves, they do crave for interaction with their owners. The other way that cats can be impacted is that one of the most common recommendations that you'll get from your allergist if you're allergic and have a cat in the household is can you remove the cat from the home to be able to help you with the allergies. It's, it's one of the most gut-wrenching decisions for anybody to take, but therefore it's one of the most commonly provided reasons for relinquishment of the cat. And finally, of course, it's a significant barrier to cat ownership and, uh, and adoption. Allergies to cat also have consequences with humans. Allergies typically cause fatigue, poor quality of sleep, reduce alertness, lower productivity and concentration. There are significant side effects of the medication that people take to be able to manage their symptoms. And above all, there is this emotional toll. You have a pet, you love the pet, the pet is part of your family, a member of your family, and you're not able to interact with them as closely as you'd like because of your allergies, and that can be a significant emotional challenge for most individuals. So in a nutshell, cat allergies have consequences both humans and cats and have something that needs to be addressed. Let's move on to what is the primary protein or the allergen that causes cat allergies. Cats produced, produce several allergens. But the most potent, the most common allergen that almost 95% of the cat allergic individuals respond to is to the protein FELD1. FELD1 is produced by all cats, regardless of breed, age, sex, weight, hair length, color pattern, etc. There are no truly hypoallergenic cats. And this is an important point that I like to emphasize. If you look at the cat on the picture, which is a hairless sphinx cat, even they produce some level of feldy one. And this is an important point for all of us to keep in mind because there is some, some uh, mention about certain breed of cats to be very low allergenic. That is not true. What we know from the studies that we have conducted that is that even within a breed, cats produce different levels of feldy one, and we'll see a little bit of that in the, the next few slides. FLD1 is primarily produced by salivary and sebaceous glands. There is some production both in the anal glands as well. But the primary protein that gets transferred to the hair is believed to come from saliva as part of the grooming process that all cats indulge in. As saliva gets deposited on the hair, it forms dander, which then gets released into the environment. Feldy one is easily airborne and remains airborne for a long number of time as small particles. Feldy one also tends to be an extremely sticky protein, so it tends to stick on to clothing. In fact, a study that was conducted in Sweden noted that even kids who do not have a pet at home, a pet cat at home, get exposed to a significant amount of Feldy one protein because kids who have cats at home as pets tend to bring them into their into the school environment attached to their books to their clothing to their coats etc in fact studies have shown that even homes or buildings that are brand new newly constructed building where no pets have ever lived you can detect significant amount of felony one because it gets tracked from the people who come to work in these buildings construction crew etc tracking felony one through the hair in, the, in their uh, jackets, in their coats, in their shoes, et cetera. 
So it is a very ubiquitous protein that's present all over the environment. And that is something to keep in mind also as we think about solutions to be able to address that. So as I described earlier, we did a study where we evaluated 60 cats over a period of a year, looking at their salivary Feldewald levels. And we had several interesting findings that I would like to quickly walk you through. So what you're seeing here are two representative cats from the study. And what you can immediately see is that although these cats are not particularly known to be low allergen breed, these are, these are just domestic shot hairs, you see that within that group of cats, there seem to be cats that have very low levels of LD1 and other cats that tend to have a very high level of LD1. The other interesting finding is that if you look at the some cats as you follow over the year, there are some cats that tend to have their feldman levels vary quite significantly during that period, and others not as much. So for instance, if you look at this particular cat, she started with a low of 4.2, but a high of 322. So there's a huge range of feldman levels that she had over the period of the year. Whereas if you look at this particular cat, the level was much more tighter, only between 0.1 and 1.2. But this is interesting is if you if you look at some of the some of the 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 experiences that I've heard from talking to people, I shared this results with a veterinarian at a meeting in Europe. And this colleague, veterinarian colleague of mine, and her husband, who happens to be allergic to cats, foster cats for over 20 years. And she mentioned that in the 20 years or so that they've been fostering cats, there are a few cats that her husband did not have any reaction to at all. In fact, two of those cats, they ended up adopting and keeping them as part of the household. And when she looked at this data, she said, this might perhaps explain my, why my husband doesn't react to these cats, because perhaps they have very low levels to begin with. And this is, this is an interesting insight and perhaps relevant to some of the, the experiences that you might have had as part of your practice or talking to friends. The most important last point that I want to make about Feldy one is the fact that the biological function for Feldy one is unknown. Therefore, the potential health and welfare effects of stopping its production are also unknown. And as you'll talk as part of the study that we have done, this is a hallmark of the approach that we have taken in that the approach that we are proposing does not stop the production, does not alter the, alter the production of Feldy 1, does not destroy the Feldy 1. In fact, it retains the normal physiology of Feldy 1 in the cats. Let's now move on and take a look at the current management strategies that people use to manage allergies. So what you're seeing here is the path that the allergen takes from the cat to the environment, and then people who are allergic to cats tend to get exposed to the allergen and then start developing allergic symptoms. If you overlay that with the management strategies people currently use, it again falls into three buckets, strategies that revolve around the cat, strategies that revolve around the environment, and strategies that revolve around the allergic individual. The two strategies that is commonly recommended today that revolved around the cat is relinquishing, which is removing the cat from the household, or avoiding interactions. Both of these are difficult to implement as we will see in the subsequent slides. The second approach is trying to manage the environment. And this really involves a lot of cleaning to be able to keep the allergen levels low. In some cases, it involves changing to hardwood floor, removing carpet and replacing it with hardwood floor washing or changing upholstery very frequently, all with the intention of trying to remove the amount of allergen that gets accumulated in a home that has a cat. The third sets of strategies revolved around the allergic individuals and really fall into two categories. One, strategies that prevent symptoms once the person is exposed to the allergen, and this involves primarily immunotherapy, where you prevent developing symptoms when you're exposed to the allergen. And then once you develop allergies and start having symptoms, you manage these symptoms by using medication. Let's quickly walk you th walk us through the, the limitations of the approaches that I described. Let's begin with approaches that revolve around the allergic individual. The two that we talked about are immunotherapy 
and treating symptoms of allergy. Immunotherapy, as you all know, can be costly and can involve long-term treatment, sometimes years. And interestingly, immunotherapy is believed to work effectively for certain allergens. But if you look at data for efficacy for cat allergies, the, the data is very limited. Most studies suggest that the efficacy for cats, cat allergies tend to be very limited. If you look at people addressing the allergen by managing the symptoms, either they take prescription drugs or over-the-counter medication, all these involve drugs that are antihistamines or decongestants. All these tend to have significant side effects and, of course, the cost involved. The other key thing to keep in mind is that both these approaches only benefit the individual who is taking them. People who undergo therapy will have benefit. If you have symptoms, you need to take medication. So in a household where you have multiple allergy sufferers, each of them has to go through this process to be able to get the benefit. Let's move on to the environmental controls. And this typically involved, as we described earlier, cleaning but also filters that can minimize the amount of allergens that gets recirculated in the household. These factors do tend to work in terms of reducing the allergen of the household, but they involve significant amount of effort. They are costly, and it is very hard to have long-term compliance because you need to be able to do this day in and day out as part of a regimen to be able to effectively manage allergen in the household. Then we go to approaches that revolved around the cat. And the two approaches that I talked about was one, removing the cat from the household. And the other one was avoiding interaction with the cat. Both these are extremely challenging for cat owners to involve with. If you talk to allergists, one of the most common recommendations they would give to their patients who has allergies to cat is to remove the cat from the household. And this is extremely gut-wrenching because the reason you adopt a pet is because you love pets. They're part of your family, and it is very hard to be able to give somebody away. In fact, talking to some of the allergists, uh, one in particular who's a pediatric allergist, and her comment was, every time I have a mom or a dad bringing their child to me for uh, evaluation, and I realize that following an uh, investigation that he or she has allergies to cat, and I suggest, can you give your cat away? The immediate reaction that I get is, how can I do that? Because that cat is my child's best friend, pet. It is going to be heart-wrenching for us to be able to give the cat away because it will have a significant negative impact on our child. And in most cases, I'm pretty certain that this particular individual will never come to me. They will go in and uh, visit another allergist to get a second opinion. In fact, if you look at statistics, over 84% of people who have allergies to cat and have, an, have a cat in the household will refuse to give the cat away but look for other solutions because it is a difficult decision for people to make. And of these, 20% would be more comfortable changing the allergist to get a different opinion rather than going with the recommendation that he or she would make. So that again talks about the bond that we have with our pets and that is something important to keep in mind as we look at the overall impact of this problem. The other approach that some people have recommended is to be is to bathe the cat. Technically, bathing the cat removes the allergen from the hair and therefore is likely to reduce the amount of allergen that this cat is going to release into the environment. But bathing a cat is challenging. As you all know, cats are not dogs. Therefore, this is an approach that is not typically recommended. Let's now look at the approach that we will be talking about, and it's important to be able to really understand the journey of LD1 as, part, as we get prepared to understand this novel approach and describe this novel approach. So what we so, saw so far is that LD1 gets secreted in the saliva. It gets, then gets distributed through the hair during the grooming process and eventually enters the environment as shed hair and dander. We saw it's, it's likely it stays up in the environment and tends gets to released into the environment and gets sticking on to carpets, upholstery, clothing, and that's how it gets disseminated within the environment. What happens when somebody who is allergic encounters the Feldy one is that it goes and binds to receptors that are present on the mast cell. 
these receptors are called as IgE molecules. So if a person is allergic to CAT, they tend to have IgE molecules that are directed against FALD1. These IgE molecules are present, bind to mast cells that are distributed throughout the body. When FALD1 molecule binds to these receptors on mast cell, it triggers a degranulation event that leads to the release of factors that results in the development of allergic symptoms. A great example of a factor like that is histamine. That's why when you have allergies, you take antihistaminic drugs. The other important idea that I want to kind of give you a quick overview and an understanding of is this concept of allergen load. Both these are important to understand the novel approach that we're talking about. Now, what you're seeing here is this red line kind of graphically describes a threshold above which if the total amount of allergen goes above that, you start having allergic symptoms. If the allergen load remains below that, you do not have allergic symptoms for this particular individual. So let's start by building in the allergens that are commonly present in the environment. And as you all know, most people tend to have allergies to more than one particular allergen. So let's look at allergen layer. This is apparently present throughout the year in the household, spring, summer, fall, winter, etc. If you build in, you have allergen B, same situation present throughout the uh, year. Allergen C, which is also present throughout the year. And if you combine the total allergen load, still below the threshold of the allergen. So you are not likely to have symptoms. This individual is not likely to have symptoms at this stage. If you build an additional allergen that goes on top of C, which is D, you can see at some points in the time your threshold goes above and you start developing allergic symptoms. Now, if you assume that, let's take for the example, as an example, if C is the is, is fairly one, if you're able to reduce the amount of allergen in the environment by how much allergen the cats are depositing into the environment, you're likely to keep the allergen load below the threshold for most of the year and therefore likely to have a benefit. Now, again, I'm trying to explain this as a concept. This is very unique to each individual, the level of sensitivity, the, the, the different allergies that they're responding to. But the concept that I want to share with you here is that you want to be able to keep the allergen below a certain threshold to be able to have no reduced symptoms. And the approach that we're taking is to be able to have a diet that I'll talk about that actually tries to do exactly that. So before we go on to the next part of my talk, where I'm going to give you a quick overview of this novel approach, let me recap the key things that we learned in the first part of my talk. FALD1 is the key allergen that most people respond to. It's a protein that is produced in the saliva as well as sebaceous secretion gets released into the environment through the grooming process where FALD1 is deposited onto the hair, dries, forms, dander, and gets into the environment. An allergic individual has IgE molecules that are specific for FALD1 that are bound to mast cells. And when FALD1 comes in contact with this particular receptor, there is a degranulation event that leads to the release of factors that cause the allergy. If we block the interaction and prevent the degranulation event, you're likely to have a benefit of not having those factors released. The final concept that we walked through was this idea of allergen load, where you want to be, the goal is to be able to keep the allergen level below a certain threshold for somebody not to have symptoms. And this is something that is also very unique for that person, for the environment they live in. But as a concept, the idea is to be able to reduce the allergen load in the environment. With that, let's quickly go into a quick description of what this novel approach for managing FLD1 is. So the goal of the approach for us was not to stop or alter the production of FLD1 because as we discussed earlier, its function is not clearly known for the cat and therefore you do not want to interfere with this production, suppress this production. But to be able to look at an alternative way of trying to keep the levels of allergen in the household below a threshold where symptoms are less likely to happen. And we use uh, an antibody technology, IGY egg antibody technology, to be able to achieve that. And I'll quickly walk you through that. This is a technology that's been 
proven to be safe and effective for decades. So a couple of words about what is IGY technology. IGY is the avian equivalent of mammalian immunoglobulin. And egg-based IGY ingredients have been used for decades in the livestock industry and now getting a lot of interest from the human dietary supplement. So it's a safe ingredient that's been used quite extensively in the food space. And this is the technology that we'll be using to try to reduce the amount of allergen that gets into the environment from the cat. So let's, let's look at this, this video that talks about using, that describes our idea of using antibodies, egg antibodies directed against FELD1 from binding and neutralizing FELD1. So if you look at the video here, what you see here are these are two IGY antibodies that is specific for FELD1 that tends to bind FELD1, which is the protein that you see in the center. Let's look at that. That's your FELD1 protein. These are IGY antibodies. So they are blocked and they have neutralized it. And this is what happens when a neutralized FELD1 binds, tries to bind to the IgE molecules that's present on mast cell. And what you're seeing here are the two IgE molecules that are depicted. This will be present on a mast cell. You can imagine a cell out there. Under normal circumstances, when the FELD1 protein comes in contact with these, it will bind these epitopes, these green surfaces that is marked, lead to what's called as a cross-linking event, and that is what triggers the release of factors that causes symptoms of allergy. Look what happens when a neutralized FELD1, in other words, a FELD1 that's been bound by anti-FELD1 antibodies derived from egg, tries to approach these two receptors. As you can see, the normal process of binding here is disrupted. It is no longer capable of binding to those receptors and therefore incapable of eliciting a degranulation event causing the release of factors that would cause symptoms of allergy. So that's the fundamental concept with which we started this work. If you put all that together in kind of a whole process flow, it starts by feeding cats a diet that's coated with egg ingredient containing anti feld IGY antibodies. As the cats eat, this antibody gets released into the saliva and it binds to the feld that is released into the saliva in the cat and these antibodies neutralize the feld this neutralized FELD1 is then transferred to the hair during the normal grooming process. And then when neutralized FELD1 comes in contact with, it's unable to activate the, the key steps that it required to do a degranulation event, it's no longer recognized as an allergen when it's released into the environment. So that's the fundamental idea with which we started this, this work. I'm going to move on to the last part of my talk, where I'll walk you through several key studies that were done to be able to establish both the safety and the efficacy of the approaches. The studies that I'll be talking about fall into two categories, in vitro and ex vivo studies. These were studies that were conducted in the laboratory, and in vivo studies that were studies that were conducted in cats. In the in vitro and ex vivo studies, the primary goal of that whole series of work was to really establish that our hypothesis, which was an antibody neutralizing FELD1, prevents FELD1 from binding and activating a mast cell. We wanted to really prove that hypothesis with laboratory experiments. After having done that, we moved on to do studies with cats, where first we wanted to establish the safety of this approach for the cat. Then we did two studies where we were able to clearly demonstrate that feeding cats a diet containing anti feld one IGY clearly reduces the amount of active feld one that's present in their saliva and on their hair. So let's begin with the first data slide. This is one of the various experiments that were conducted. The first set of experiments that, that I'm not going to be showing today clearly show that you can physically prevent feld one protein from binding human IgE molecules if it's neutralized with an anti feld one IgY antibody. What you see here is that, that preventing that interaction has clear biological consequences. 
So let me quickly walk you through what we have here. What you're looking at is an experiment that actually measures the ability of PELD1 and initiating a degranulation event and our ability to show that if you neutralize the PELD1, you're able to significantly reduce this degranulation event, which is the key hypothesis with which we started this idea. What you're seeing on the, on the y-axis is the degranulation, degranulation event that is depicted in these blue bars, and it's set at 100%. What you're seeing here is mast cells are binding to PELD1, which is not neutralized, and you're clearly able to establish that there is significant amount of degranulation. You set that at 100%. Then you see what happens when you now challenge the mast cell with the PELD1 protein that is neutralized. What you can clearly see is that you're able to prevent or reduce the degranulation process by as much as 60% when you're now challenging the mast cell with a PELD1 molecule that is neutralized with anti PELD1 IgY. What you're seeing here are control experiments where if you use IgY that is not specific with PELD1, you do not have any impact on reduction of degranulation event. So what this, this data, these sets of experiments clearly showed that the hypothesis which we started has significant merit in that if you prevent PELD1 from binding to human Ig by neutralizing it using an anti-IgY antibody, you're clearly able to prevent the degranulation event that is required for the symptoms of allergies to happen. Having established that, we then moved on to do studies with cats. And the first study that we wanted to establish was the approach is safe for cats. And this is paramount in all the studies that we do as Purina, where we put the safety of the cat at the heart of all the work we do. As you all know, we are pet owners, we love cats and dogs, and we want to be sure that anything that we do above all has no negative impact for that. So this was a very crucial study for us to complete before we started the other studies where we could show the efficacy of the approach. Briefly, this was a six month study with 40 cats, along with the control group, there were three other groups of cats that were fed levels that were many times higher than the levels of egg antibodies that were used in the efficacy studies. And during the six month period, we had a whole series of veterinary evaluations that were done. This included clinical evaluation, we evaluated body weight, food consumption, ophthalmic evaluation, blood chemistry, um, blood count, CBC, coagulation, urine analysis. There was also some behavior analysis done to see if there's any impact on the behavior of the cat. And we looked at the data after the six month of feeding, what we clearly demonstrated and noticed that there was no clinical difference between the control levels where no anti feld one antibody were present or any of the levels tested, clearly showing that this approach is perfectly safe for cats. This was work that was published uh, uh, late last year, in the journal Frontiers in Veterinary Science. So having established the safety of the approach for the cat, we went on to do our first study where we asked the question, does the approach reduce the amount of active feld one in the saliva of the cat? For this study, we selected cats that had moderate or higher levels of feld one expression so that we can measure feld one reduction in these cats. There are some cats, as we saw earlier, that have very low levels to begin with. And if you include them in a study, if those levels are slightly above or below the level of detection of the ELISA, you really cannot show a decrease. So therefore, those cats are eliminated from the study. Samples, saliva samples are collected five hours after the morning feeding. And the amount of active feld was measured using an ELISA kit and this was evaluated as weekly averages. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what I mean by active feld The ELISA kit uses the same approach where the feld antibody has to bind to the capture antibody in the kit to be able to detect. A neutralized feld which is unable to bind to human Ig is also not able to bind to the capture antibody in the ELISA assay, and therefore the ELISA assay can only detect free feld in other words, neutralized feld one cannot be detected. And therefore, what I'm referring to active feld one is feld one that is still remaining in the saliva of the cat that 
is not bound by anti-PLD1 IGY and therefore not utilized. When we looked at the data from the study, each CAD served as its own control. And here are results from the study. What you're seeing here is uh, weeks on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you're looking at mean change from baseline from the statistical model that was used to evaluate the data. And what you can see is that while you do see a decline in the control group, there was a statistically significantly greater decline seen in the test group starting from week three. In fact, you got a 24% reduction of, of active felumen in the saliva of these cats starting from week three onwards. This was work that was published also last year in the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery. Having established the fact that the approach that we started with can clearly reduce the amount of active feld one in the saliva of the cat, we went on to ask the question, what happens to the amount of active feld one in the hair of the cats? So here's the summary of the, of the findings from the study. So the first proof of concept study clearly showed that feeding a dry cat food coated with anti feld one IGY significantly reduced active feld one in the saliva of the cat starting with the third week of feeding. Having done this, we went on to ask the question, what happens to the amount to the hair feld one levels? And for this, we designed the study to be able to ask the exact same question, which is, can a diet containing anti feld one antibody reduce the amount of active feld one in the hair of this cat? This was a much larger study where we had 105 cats that were fed a controlled diet for two weeks, followed by a test diet for 10 weeks. Hair was collected by brushing the front, shoulder, and sides of this cat. Active feld one was measured using the same ELISA assay that I described earlier and was evaluated as weekly average, averages, and each cat served as its own control. Here are the results from the study. What you're seeing on the y-axis is the week's baseline and week one to week 10. On the y-axis, you're looking at the absolute feld even levels, uh, levels uh, in these cats here. And what you can clearly see is that, again, there is a decline starting from week one and week two. But starting week three, you start seeing a dramatic decrease in the amount of active feld even that can be detected in the hair of this cat. And that lasts almost until the end of the study. This work was also published earlier last year in the journal Immunity, Inflammation, and Disease. If you look at the data overall, 97% of the cats showed reduction of feld one levels as compared to the baseline. 86% of the cats showed a reduction of 30% or greater. And 50% of the cats showed a reduction of 50% or greater. And let me put that in context for you. What this shows us that the approach of feeding a diet containing anti feld one antibodies is clearly able to reduce the amount of active feld one in the hair by as much as 50% based on, on the data that we have uh, uh, from the study. And that is kind of denoted here. If you look at the average reduction over the period from week three to week 10, there was an average reduction of about 40% clearly showing that you're able to reduce the amount of active LD1 by almost 50% once these cats get onto the diet containing anti feld one antibodies. Let's go back to what we started here, because both these studies clearly shows that the approach of trying to use an anti feld one antibody as part of the diet is able to reduce the amount of active feld one both in the saliva and in the hair, and as you saw in the last slide, there's a dramatic reduction of the amount of active feld one that is detected in the hair. And if you connect that with the earlier idea of trying to reduce the amount of allergen in the environment below a threshold, this is clearly has the potential to be able to deliver that. So if you go back to the slide that we started where we were looking at the current, ma the current management of, of cat allergies, approaches revolving around the cat, approaches revolving around the environment, and then approaches around the allergic individual. What we're proposing is another approach that can be added to this overall strategy to be able to reduce the allergen level that eventually gets into the environment. 
What's unique about the approach, as we saw in the studies that I described, is that not only is it safe and effective, but it's also very simple to use. Because if you look at if you look at the earlier approaches, relinquishment avoidance challenging for an individual to adopt. Cleaning, extremely tedious, hard to be able to keep maintaining. And, and of course, approaches that involve the allergic individual, you have to have significant investment and time and effort to be able to get those benefits. The approach that we are proposing is, is simple in the sense that you have to just feed the diet. You don't have to do anything else. And the active ingredient in the diet is able to deliver the benefit of reducing the amount of active value one. So not only is it safe and effective, but it's also extremely simple because you don't need to change any other routine that you need to do as part of the approach to manage the allergens in the environment. So the scientific breakthrough that, I, that I'm so excited to share with you and walk you through these slides is really a part of a comprehensive allergy management plan. And we believe this approach can reduce cat allergens while importantly keeping the cat in its loving home which I know is extremely important for people like me as well as others who love their pets. So let's quickly summarize the key points that we discussed during this uh, presentation. So the innovation delivers specific anti-Feldman antibodies, also called as IGY, in an egg product ingredient that is coated onto the cat's kibble. The anti-Feldman IGY is safe, and it effectively neutralizes active feldiman in the mouth of the cat as the cat chews the food. As cat grooms, the neutralized feldiman is transferred to the cat's hair. Neutralized feldiman is no longer recognizable as an allergen when released into the environment. And most fundamental to this approach is that the normal feldiman production is maintained and cat's overall physiology is not impacted. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Satyaraj, to give us a very brilliant and innovative, you know, lecture. So right now from the attendees, we can accept the questions. So you can raise your hand and we can unmute you or you can text, it, text your question from the chat, however you like. Okay, John has a question. Right, go ahead, John. Hello, doctor. Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, how long usually does the uh, protein sticks to to a surface or an, a clothing for for how long does it stay there and how long usually it deteriorates and it doesn't make um, a uh, allergic reaction to humans afterwards that right that's that's a very good question and that's one of the unique things about uh, feldy one protein now, as you all know from a biochemical perspective most proteins tend to have half-lives so roughly how long does it take for a quantity to be degraded into half if it stays in a particular environment Studies have shown that the half-life for Feldy one tends to be very long, roughly about six months. So if you start with 10 units, it's going to go to five units in six months and then go on for. So that is one of the reasons why even in households, once you have the cat removed and thoroughly cleaned, you tend to have the allergen sticking around. You also have the challenge of this allergen then because of its ability to get stuck to materials like coats, jackets, bags, equipment, etc. It's very easy for it to get transported to different parts of the household, in the community, 
and therefore in even homes or locations where no cat has ever been, you tend to have significant levels of fall live undetected. So that's kind of the unique nature of this allergen, which uh, causes some of the complexity and the challenges that you see. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a question from chat. Mohana from India asked, which countries is this kind of cat food launched commercially? Well, I, I, I don't have the information off the top of my head because I typically talk about the science piece, but my understanding is it's available in North America, it is available in Canada, some countries in Latin America. In Asia, I believe Japan, Korea, uh, as well as some uh, Australia and New Zealand. I'm not sure about India as yet. So, and that is something that you know, if you if you send in your information over to uh, the organizers, we may be able to help you get that answer. But I, I'm based on what I know so far. I don't think it's available in India as yet. Okay, thank you. Also, I have a question. You know, as we know, uh, IG-1 is an immunoglobin that, you know, we find in avians, as you said. How does it work in a cat? That's a, that's a very, very important question to, to answer and, and understand because what IG-1 does, it actually goes and physically binds the allergen in the oral cavity. So if I discuss, as I described in the earlier part of my talk, the allergen is secreted into the saliva. From there, it gets onto the hair because of the grooming behavior that cats exhibit. Mm -hmm. And what the IGY that you deliver through diet does is it goes and binds to the allergen. And therefore, the important point there is it does not destroy the allergen or break down the allergen, does not prevent the cat from producing and secreting the protein. And that is important to point out because we don't know what the function of fel is for the cat. So we just don't want to completely switch off its production. All we're doing is you're binding it and masking it and preventing it from interacting with the human machinery that eventually caused the symptoms. Oh, so okay. it's purely a physical interaction only in the oral cavity. Now, once the some of the protein obviously is going to be swallowed, some of the IGY is going to be swallowed as part of the diet, then it's going to be trans treated just like any other protein that gets digested. Okay. Thank you for answering that question. Mohana also asked, is Purina the first and the only brand to do this research and launch the product? That is correct. Yes, Mohana. Yes, that's the, we are, we are the only, we are the first to do the work. I know that for certain, and I'm also very certain that we are the only one who have a product in the market that is able to deliver this benefit. Uh, Isabel asked that, do you think this diet or some similar technology should be used even in households in which there are no humans with cat allergies, thinking about the potential impact community health since FELD1 stays in the environment for so long? Pardon me. And that's an interesting question, and I really cannot comment from the uh, standpoint for community health perspective. But one of the things to keep in mind is, and this is something that we've heard from, excuse me, the lots of consumers is that, let's say somebody has a cat in the household and uh, they are able to manage their symptoms taking tolerance therapy, for example. The, the challenge with that approach is that only benefits you. And let's say there is nobody else in your household who has allergies, doesn't, doesn't ca cause them any issue. But let's say a friend or a relative is coming home who or she or she might have allergies. The, the, the approach you're taking to prevent your symptoms is not going to translate and benefit them. That's one of the unique things about this approach is because you're trying to tackle the allergen at its source. So it's likely to benefit you others in the household on anyone who comes in, in, in your home. So in that sense, it makes sense uh, to, to kind of look at this approach very differently from what you do with the, with the traditional approaches that people take today, which I described in my presentation. So that's one of the unique features of our, of our strategy. Okay, can I ask a related question to this? Okay, so um, does it matter for, I mean, does 
does it do a change for a cat to eat, you know, a normal formula or this kind of a formula for, you know, its you know, own thing? As far as as far as the the diet is just a it's a highly nutritious. It's a great formula, as, as many of you know. So whether you feed this diet or feed any other diet to the cat, a diet that is able to deliver the same level of nutrients that's required, you're going to get the benefit for the for the cat. And as I told you, there is no direct impact of this particular protein to the cat because all that it does is physically binds the allergen. The allergen then gets released into the environment through the grooming process. It's bound and neutralized. As soon as this protein is eaten, it's just going to be treated like any other protein. So there is no direct benefit in that sense to the cat. And also in the studies that we have showed, and I, I walked through, there has no significant biological impact on the cat that are eating this particular diet or a, or a test that contains significantly higher levels of the in, uh, antibody in their diet. And that really speaks to the safety of the approach for the cat. Yeah, that sounds really great. Thank you for answering that. Again, you guys, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand and we can give you the mic. You can unmute yourselves then. Or as the other, you know, attendees did, you can write your questions to the chat. So we'll be happy to answer those. So how did the idea came out? So the idea came out of a personal in, uh, experience that I had, which I described in the presentation. We didn't realize our daughter was allergic until she came home one day with, with, uh, with, with you know, symptoms. And then uh, I, I got interested in this in this particular topic, and there were some discussions going on at that time within the company, within my my research group, to say, is that a way for us to be able to specifically uh, block the allergen or remove the gene? Now, it has two challenges doing that. One, technically, it's very very difficult to do. Second. Again, going back to what I said earlier, you do not want to shut off a deleted gene whose function you don't fully understand because there are consequences to the cat. And one of the hallmarks of everything we do as Purina is to be able to ensure that the safety of the pet is paramount. So then, so then we get went down the path saying, if, if that's not possible, is that a way for us to have a different way of blocking the allergen? And that's that's really how this whole idea came out. And it's been... Uh, almost a decade and a half that we've been working on this. It's such a creative and brilliant idea. And Isabel asked another question saying that, is there much research being done to find out the physiological function of FLD1 in the cat? Great question. Uh, there is not much. There is very little information out there. Uh, some people believe that this has some kind of a pheromone type function, but again, it's all speculation at this point. What we know is that uh, both male and female cats produce FLD1. Male tend to have a slightly lower levels, and as soon as they are neutered or desexed, the levels kind of go back to a little lower than what where they started. But all this is just based on a few publications. I don't think a thorough study has been done to define the physiological function of FLD1. None that I've seen published. Thank you for answering that question. Okay, does anyone else have any other question? Is there anything else you would like to inform us about this? No, again, I think I think the the the, the key message I want to leave you to you is that this is a unique approach that yes. is both safe, mm -hmm. simple, and effective. It also want to highlight the amount of work that went into developing this. It's safe for the cat. And it also speaks to the commitment that we have to be able to be able to really bring revolutionary science and implement in our product. So um, I'm great. I'm hoping this will get sold all over the world eventually and people can benefit from it. And want to thank you all for the opportunity to be able to speak to uh, to this audience, which is global, which which is what I enjoy. I see people from India, Indonesia, Europe, Africa. So th this is amazing. Thank you for you know attend this meeting, attend this lecture with us. We're so grateful to have you.
way. Thank you very much. Also, I've seen, you know, in Turkey, I'm living, I'm based in Turkey. Okay. I've seen the commercials and I've seen it being sold on market now. And I know that a lot of people, a lot of, you know, friends of mine who has, you know, cat allergies, even though they're in vet school, <laughs> now switching to this, you know, to give it a try. And as I've heard, it's, you know, working well. So it's just really great to do, you know, such a big impact with, you know, so simple and so safely. Yeah, so that's really great. Uh, have you been getting so the feedback that you've been getting, and you can any of you can Google and check. For example, it was sold on Amazon or Chewy.com. These are two websites in the U.S. Amazon, everybody knows Chewy. I think is only in North America. The the rec the re the reviews that we get is quite incredible, and I think that to me is is the most amazing thing of all this because you spend all this time, do all this research, publish stuff. But you, when you see a story where a mother is able to now still have the cat in the household that their daughter loves and adores, despite having allergies, because you have a solution that makes a difference there. That to me is really the incredible. Uh, it, 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 great, it brings great joy for researchers like me to be able to hear that story. It is one thing to publish a paper in science, but to be able to make an impact in people's life on an everyday basis, that's quite a privilege. That's so great to hear. I also have another question. Uh, do we have, you know, a similar technology that you're developing or anyone else is developing for dogs? You know, dog allergies? Great question. So uh, dog allergies are different uh, because of a couple of important things. One is the dog allergen is not, dog allergies are not primarily driven by one particular allergen. There are multiple allergens that dogs produce, and there is some debate as to where these allergens are primarily released into. Cats have two unique features. It is all primarily Feldy one, and most of that is produced in the saliva. So it gives us a great way for us to interact with it through diet. In uh, dogs, some production also happens in the skin. So we are actually looking into the question and say, does it make sense for us to do a similar kind of an approach? Uh, th that's work that is ongoing. Too early to say whether it's even feasible and what the next steps would be. Okay, so there isn't a common thing, just you know, one thing in dogs like just as in cats. Correct, yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah. Well, I hope we'll see you know some technology about that too soon. Right, it is also a big algorithm you know, and you know, there are a lot, lot of dogs they're also larger animals, though they, they do can produce yeah, quite a bit of allergen and release it into the environment for sure, yeah. Okay. Now, again, I'm, you know, repeating myself. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. We're just, you know, accepting your questions right now. You can uh, raise your hand and then we can unmute you or you can, you know, write your question to the chat, however you like. John has a question again. Yeah, John, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. I can, yeah. All right, so my question would be uh, a little bit off, uh, off the topic, but it's still with regards to cat allergens. So mm -hmm. uh, you have mentioned that uh, usually cat, are, cat allergens are uh, specifically um, produced in the saliva and um, you said that it also attaches to their fur mm -hmm. because they, the way they do their uh, they lick their fur and mm -hmm. their skin so would it be possible to have in the future uh, to have a kind of um, system where it would be um, applied to the external surface rather than having it on the diet? Great question. Um, so what you're really asking is, as I described the trajectory that Feldman takes, it starts with the saliva, gets onto the hair because of the grooming behavior, and then eventually into the environment when that uh, saliva dries and forms dander and gets released into the environment. 
we are by type we are primarily addressing one or the main source. We do have a do we have a solution that uh, can be applied to the uh, hair or of the cats, right? Uh, it's a it's a it's a dry shampoo product which when you apply on the coat of the hair uh, of the cat, it tends to break down the allergen. Now, because of some other commercial reason that is only being sold, I know it's sold in North America. I'm not sure if it is sold globally. Um, so that is that is available. We have we developed this. It's a completely different technology than what we did with the with the antibody. And I'll come and explain why that's important. Um, but that is available. And again, using a combination of diet and this dry shampoo actually gives you added benefit. And we have actually tested the shampoo by itself and shown that it reduces the allergen level. Now, I know there are some discussions happening on the commercial end of the team to see if they can start thinking about, you know, going global with that, but I, I don't know where that stands. Now, coming back to the science, um, if, if you think about antigen-antibody reaction, which is exactly what's happening in the oral cavity, you have the Feldman, which is the antigen, the antibodies, the egg antibody that is binding occurring. As you all know, antigen-antibody reactions need to have certain conditions for it to be in the interaction to happen and the and the complex to remain stable. When it gets into the hair, it gets extremely dry. And therefore, even if you're able to deliver an antibody, unless there is enough moisture, the likelihood of having an effective blocking tends to be a little lower. At least that's the theoretical expectation. Therefore, we did not spend a lot of time developing a solution with the antibody for the coat of the cat. We went to a different approach, which essentially breaks down the allergen that is that is present on the on the hair. Uh, does that answer your question, John? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. That's a great great point. I think you you really you under, you're understanding the heart of the process. There are two sites, and how how can we target both? Yeah. Okay, another question from Mohana. Uh, what I've noticed is that human protect practitioners and pediatrics are very against keeping cats as pets more than dogs because of numerous ailments such as allergies, toxoplasmosis, cat scratch disease, etc. What is your opinion as a researcher on felines? Are cats notorious pets, rightly so, or is it just a prejudice? It's, that's a great question. <laughs> to me, a pet is a pet. I don't. I don't care what it is. You need to be able to have the right precautions to be able to take it. So, I know there are there are people who love and adore their pets more than their children, right? <laughs> so, uh, I, I don't think that's that's a that's a relevant uh, recommendation. I think this also comes to brings to an, brings to focus an important question is is that. When, when human allergists talk to their patients, they don't understand the relationship that people have with their pets. Uh, there was an interesting uh, exchange that I had with uh, a lady who's the head of the European Allergy, uh, Immunology and Allergy uh, uh, Society. She's a professor of pediatric allergy in uh, um, Italy. Her name is uh, Professor Moraro. Antonella Moraro. And, and she said, you know, I, in my practice, I see a lot of patients. And many of those are children whose parents bring them because either they have an allergy to various things and cat allergies is very common. And in some situations, I, the advice I give them is that your daughter or son is allergic. The best recommendation I can make is to be able to recommend giving the cat away. As soon as I make that comment or make that recommendation, you can see the change in their in the in the patient's mother's or father's face, and in many cases they never come back to me because even though they have these issues, it is very hard for them to be able to give away the pet that their son or daughter loves very much. So I think this is uh, this is a challenge, and and the communication between human allergist and pediatric allergist, you know, has to be something that 
that has to be discussed. Now, I know there are certain situations where the allergy is extremely ex extreme or very severe. There may be reasons. But this is a great topic for all of you guys to bring up in this one world, this one one health discussion that is happening where you're trying to get both human you know, uh, doctors and veterinarians in the same room so that they can understand the challenges and, and, and the opportunities for us to, for them to be engaging with both their patients. In the case of allergy, it's a unique situation because you have a pet involved, you have a human involved, there's a human allergist and a veterinarian. So it, it's a great uh, discussion to have at some point. But yeah. it's, it's a very important point that you bring up, uh, uh, yeah, Mohana. Also, Mohana agrees with you when you said, you know, they're just like our children. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, mean, I, I was reading through that and say, you know, we do so much for I, I've got I've got a son in, in college and I've got two teenagers, twins who are in uh, in high school. If, with some of the tantrums they do and the things that we do, we sometimes wonder what we have these kids, but you, you still love them. Right. So it's the same with pets. <laughs> Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. I myself have a cat and she's just like my daughter, even though she's like very, she's a tabby cat. Uh -huh. and she's very, very playful. Yeah. And some people are like, when, I mean, she harms the house, she harms me sometimes. <laughs> but <laughs> some people are just saying, no, get rid of the cat. I cannot yeah. do that. She's my daughter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But your kids sometimes, you know, they, they mess up that. They, yeah, but you still love them because they are your children. The same thing. Yeah, they do. don't understand that. <laughs> But it's a, it's a great topic in that one, is it One Health? Is that what that's called now, where people are having these dialogues across veterinarians and humans, uh, human doctors and veterinarians uh, talking? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very important topic to, you know, bring up because people always look at, you know, doctors and veterinarians, you know, separately. Yeah. But what we all do is try to, you know, make humanity healthier with you know why you know while making the you know animals healthier we're just seeking for everyone's health so mm -hmm. it's a very great to great topic to discuss and bring up and what we do in this symposium is i think really great and binding for everyone to under and it's very important for everyone to understand how you know we should be working together and we're not working for, you know, separate things for different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually a great way to look at that. And there are so many other topics in that, but this this is an interesting conversation to have in that context for sure. Yeah. So do we have any other questions? Now, by the way, Mohana, I grew up in Mumbai, so I'm very fluent in Marathi. I'm assuming you speak Marathi as well, or at least likely to speak Marathi as well. So, <laughs> yeah, she does. <laughs> Great. <laughs> she lives in Mumbai. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. I'm I'm from Dombivli. I don't know if you, if you know the, <laughs> the town. If you're from Mumbai, you probably know. Yeah. Or I grew up there and I no longer live there, but uh, yeah. Great. That's great. Yeah, she's got family there too. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we call this Dumbavlikar is, is how they call it in Marathi, but <laughs> it's a small world. It was a pleasure listening to you today, Mohana said. <laughs> Great. And I agree, it was a very delightful presentation and lecture to have. Thank you again for right. being with us in this meeting. Excellent, thank you all. Uh, and I know you got sessions going on throughout this day or? Yeah, we have, yeah, throughout this day. And, you know, right now we have another sessions too going on. So we, you know, separate the attendees equally to every lecture. Excellent. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Pleasure talking to you all and good luck with your uh, careers as you as you get to go and do great things in the world.
Thank you again. All right. Bye now. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.